Hey everyone, Charlie Gassmeyer here. Welcome to a very, very special edition of Airplane Academy. If you're anything like me enjoying aviation, you probably like uh, space travel as well. And my whole life, I have been watching the old Apollo missions and the space shuttle missions, and now the SpaceX missions, and everything that has to do with aviation and into space travel, I just love, and there's a high chance that you love that too. And so it's been a huge goal of mine to be able to actually talk to an astronaut and get their perspective on space travel and what that means for their lives today uh, back on the ground with the rest of us. And so today it is my honor and privilege to welcome Mr. Tom Henricks to the channel today. He is an extremely accomplished person in so many realms, not just in the space program, but he is a four-time astronaut. He flew uh, two missions in the space shuttle as a pilot and two additional missions as a commander. He is on F-16s, F-4s. He's got hundreds of skydives uh, on his record. He is the person to talk to about this. And so it's my honor to welcome him to the channel today. Tom, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Charlie. Looking forward to it. Yeah, well, we, um, we have a lot to cover, and I kind of want to structure it in kind of three different sections. The first, kind of talking about becoming an astronaut. Uh, the second thing, really just talking about your time in space and all that that entails. And then the third uh, aspect is kind of what are you doing today? What is aviation like for you now that you've been into the heavens and back? And so that's kind of how I want to spend our time. We'll, we'll jump right in. Um, so talk to us about your transition into becoming an astronaut. Was that a, a lifelong pursuit for you? You came out of the Air Force and went into uh, the 1985 astronaut class. So talk to us a little bit about that transition. So, Charlie, I'm a farm boy. Grew up on the farm in Ohio. No one in my family had ever gone to college, but I was going through school during the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo era, and I had my own scrapbook tracking those programs. Loved it. Never entered my mind that I would go to space. But I ended up going to the Air Force Academy, and a couple years after graduation, this was 1976 now, the Air Force and NASA started recruiting pilots to become space shuttle astronauts. Even though I was a young lieutenant, I applied because I thought, well, now they're asking guys like me to go to space, maybe I have a chance. It actually took me four applications before I got to NASA, so persistence was key to that. So talk to us about that moment of being selected, and especially after applying four times. What was getting that phone call, I presume? What was that like of saying, I'm going to be an astronaut? So I knew this was my last opportunity because there was an age limit on when you could apply as an Air Force pilot. And it was a three-day weekend. I'm on vacation in Las Vegas in a hotel, and NASA found me, caught me in the room. And the first question was, Tom, are you still interested in becoming a NASA astronaut? Answer's obvious. And that's when they said, OK, we'd like to have you report in uh, June and I was just stunned. Um, obviously celebrated that day, it, it, it changed my life. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's even hard. I'm thinking about what that must have been like and what kind of emotion comes to mind. I mean, I'm sure shock, awe, anticipation. I mean, did, yeah. you, did you have any appreciation for the things you were about to go experience now? Not really. The uh, interview process was pretty in-depth, but it was more of them evaluating you than you getting a chance to see what the job was gonna be like. Mm -hmm. So we were just like anybody else in the public with our understanding of what the job would be, but we were all eager to get going. So as soon as I got the call, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get down to Houston. But before I left the Air Force, I had to explain to my chain of command why I was transitioning to NASA, even though I remained in the Air Force. And I actually had one colonel that tried to talk me out of it. He said, Tom, you got such a great career going in the Air Force, why would you give that up to go to space? And I said, well, I, I prefer to go to space. And I did that as an Air Force officer, so I didn't see a conflict. Mm. You had a very good reason to leave, <laughs> to go do that. So let's get right into your time in space. One of the things I've always wanted to be able to ask an astronaut is about the launch process. And specifically, you know, when I watched the last SpaceX, SpaceX launch uh, a couple times, because they, they, had to, they had to try a few times before they were able to actually launch, that moment of being strapped in and, and, and waiting uh, I really, I got to know what's going through your head, you know, emotionally, mentally, when you're strapped in for sometimes hours, uh, waiting to go, what, what on earth is going through your head at that moment? So it, there's really kind of a build up to that point. So you go into quarantine, astronauts go into quarantine, which means they don't want to come close to them. It's like being quarantined for COVID. Mm -hmm. They didn't want us to go into space with any uh, bugs, any viruses. So we would quarantine ourselves for a week before a launch 
the last three days of that, we would be down at the Kennedy Space Center with very little to do except to wait for the launch. That's when you start worrying because you've been so busy getting ready to go that you never had time to think about it. Then three days before the launch, you go down to Florida, you see this gigantic vehicle on the launch pad and it finally hits you. They're gonna ask me to get on that thing. <laughs> I gotta get in that. <laughs> this is gonna yeah. be where I'm at in three days. Mm -hmm. And that's when you have the thoughts about, do I have my things in order? Have I said what I wanted to say to everybody I love? Mm -hmm. And you have the nightmares. But when you go out to the launch pad to get to your, the answer to your question, that's when you get the game face on. That's when the training kicks in, even though as a commander, we were in the first one in and had about two hours to wait till we launched. You went through all the checklists. You made jokes about the doctor because the doctor was the only one on the intercom outside the crew. And you tried to keep everyone light and relaxed while everyone finished being strapped in. And then as the countdown gets closer to launch, there's a period where you have a hard time staying awake because the crew that helped you strap in has all left. They're going through all the checks to make sure the shuttle's buttoned up. There's a lot of chatter in the background between mission control and all the engineers. But in the cockpit, there's really nothing to do for about an hour. And you struggle to stay awake. And a lot of us happen to get a little nap in then. But once we hit the nine minute hold, when you come out of that, they have already pulled everyone involved to give a thumbs up or a go for launch. Mm -hmm. When you come out of that hold, it is game on. You're focused. And when the solid rocket boosters light, the entire vehicle lurches. This is a four and a half million pound vehicle that lurches. And you just pray that you're gonna go up because something behind you just exploded. And when you come off the pad, in less than a minute, you're going supersonic, you're burning propellants at the rate of 12 tons a second, and you're on the way to space. It's hard to believe. Um, let's go back for a second. So. It's so such the opposite of what I would have expected you to say that, you know, those moments in the hour strapped in, you, you're taking a nap. You know, it's hard to stay awake. That, I never would have thought that. I would have thought it's the opposite. What do you attribute that to? Is that attributed to your training? Is it because you, you've, you've been there before? Uh, part of it is, um, as test pilots, of course, we had taken some risk. And you realize once you're strapped in, you've already accepted that risk. There's nothing you're going to do except be prepared so you don't create any risk. Mm -hmm. And if you're confident that you're ready to go, relax. Mm -hmm. I have nothing else really to do. Right. So you mentioned something kind of talking about to your crew and, and kind of keeping them calm. So did, did this moment and kind of the buildup to launch, did it change much from you, launch number one to four, the things that are kind of going through your head and your demeanor and your responsibilities when you're strapped in waiting to go? What did that look like? Great question. Great question. For the, my first launch was a night launch a couple years after the Challenger accident. So that was a whole different experience, especially for the family. Because the family, all the families were aware of the risk at that time. So the calmness was part of it. And as the pilot and commander, you don't want to be up there nervous and, and uh, making the rest of the crew uncomfortable. So you, it's professional. Um, but the first launch was a night launch and the simulators didn't prepare me for that. They just didn't do the solid booster separation justice because you're in a fireball <laughs> and remember this is a few years after challenger mm -hmm. and two minutes into the flight we're in a fireball mm -hmm. that was kind of a heart stopper mm -hmm. um, seeing the earth for the first time uh, with the full moon rising i'll never forget that it was like a star trek experience mm -hmm. my second mission was with uh, a german crew we had uh, two germans on board as the main engine started, as you know, the shuttle had three main engines on the back and they start six seconds before the booster's light. Well, the third one had a valve failure and shut down the engines. So for about the next two minutes, we were rocking back and forth because those engines, when they build up thrust, they're bending the solid rocket boosters. And in a normal launch, when the flexion comes back to vertical, you launch. But if the engine shut off, we twanged for about two minutes. So that was unique for that mission. The third mission was the one where we had the woodpeckers attack the external tank. About like, a month. like a bird, like woodpeckers? Yes, literally. <laughs> if you recall, the external, I'll use a prop here. So the coating on this external tank is about the consistency of styrofoam, and it's three or four inches thick. 
So the woodpecker was pecking through there to make a nest and he'd hit aluminum and move to a different spot. So he ruined the insulation uh, around that external tank. We had to cancel the launch, roll the entire stack back in and fix it. I ask, so are there any new protocols or, or funky checklists now items in NASA for woodpeckers? Yes, they put up <laughs> bird prevention. Okay. So they have to be careful because it's a bird sanctuary. So you can't go around harvesting mm -hmm. the birds. Mm -hmm. They just had to tease the birds into going somewhere else to, to nest rather than the, the external tank. So all those funny regulations are always there for a reason. So right. you, know, you have to ask where that came right. from. Just like with any type of flying. Mm -hmm. So what about your third and fourth launch? Well, so the third one went smoothly after we fixed the woodpecker problem. And, and that was, uh, and by the way, you, you mentioned, uh, I think, something about launches. Normally, one in three will go as scheduled. So when I invited guests down to watch a launch, I always told them that there was uh, only one of the three chances that they see us launch on time. So go have a vacation and hopefully you see a, a SpaceX or a space shuttle launch. Mm -hmm. Fourth mission was uh, unique because we had an Italian and a Spaniard as backups and we had a Frenchman and a Canadian on the crew. So it was very international uh, atmosphere. Uh, that countdown went smoothly and we launched and spent 18 days in space. And the unique thing on that mission was they gave us a, a lipstick lens camera, primarily just to show for the first time what it was like for the crew to get on board the show live. Well, we figured out how to make that live link uh, recordable during launch. So although we couldn't downlink it live, we recorded the entire launch from inside the cockpit for the first time and downlink that. That was exciting. That's awesome. So let's go back a little bit. I, I don't want to. I don't want to miss this. I really want to hear your version of it. Talking about the actual launch and saying you're getting, you know, you feel, you can tell something just blew up essentially behind you. Just kind of walk us through the, the few minutes of actually getting to orbit. What, what is that like? Sure. So when the solid boosters light, especially if it's your first flight, we would tell each other, "I left half my brain on the launch pad," because as you know, one of the first things they teach you as a pilot is to stay ahead of the airplane. Well, when the airplane goes supersonic in 55 seconds, climbing at seven degrees angle and eight and a half minutes you're in space going Mach 25, it's really a challenge to stay ahead of the bird. And I would admit, I left half my brain on the launch pad that first night launch. Uh, I did remember to look out the window, but by the fourth mission, which was within a five year span, I was comfortable with it. I was able to stay ahead of the bird, um, anticipated all the uh, motions, sounds, uh, and sensations like you would in any other airplane. You get the feel for it. And the attitude I took as a commander, because you have to be able to take control uh, anytime after two minutes in flight or take emergency action at any point in the flight, and you have to be confident uh, enough to do that. So just like any other airplane, I mentally had to strap the shuttle on. I couldn't just get in and let somebody else attach me to the shuttle. Mm -hmm. I had to strap that vehicle on, and that, that's how I overcame mm -hmm. that challenge. And I recommend that to any pilot. Mm -hmm. You've gotta become confident and comfortable enough in your airplane that you strap that baby on. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting you say that. I was actually filming a, a video last week, and, and that's an expression I often use, especially on, on mornings when you get to go fly down a river or down a canyon. It, it, it really feels like you set on a, a, your own set of wings. Right. And uh, I, I never thought I would have heard an, an astronaut explain it the same way about the shuttle. That's great. So you talked uh, about some surprises, you know, on the, on the launch pad or, or things getting rescheduled. What about in space? What kind of surprises or difficulties did, did you encounter that, you know, people back on Earth or even watching it uh, broadcast on TV just don't have an appreciation for? What kind of things would you run into? So every mission, and, and currently on the space station, Things break. They're machines. Things break down, hardware, software. Well, the pilots on board the shuttle were the mechanics. You can't call for uh, uh, somebody to come up and help you. You can coordinate with the folks on the ground, but to do the actual repairs were uh, done by the pilots. So one of the major ones I did was fix the toilet on one of the missions. We had a wastewater tank. It wasn't really a toilet. Fix the wastewater tank and repair that. and it, it took me back to my farm days because once I sealed up the uh, plumbing that I had to redo, they said, well, we'll have to put pressure on it and watch the pressure 
bleed down for hours before we can let you use the toilet. Well, so how about if I just use a saliva test like you would on a tire? And it took them a few minutes and they understood what I meant. They said, sure, try the saliva test. No bubbles, open the toilet. Mm -hmm. But the strange things that I think a lot of people don't appreciate is how difficult it is sleeping in space mm -hmm. because you're floating. So you don't have the comfort of lying on a mattress. You don't have the comfort of your head being on a pillow or the blankets being on top of you. You're just floating. Mm -hmm. So to compensate for that, we would strap a pillow to our head with Velcro, just a, a cushion. And if you had it on your forehead, you'd be lying on your stomach. And if you want to roll over, you just rotate that pad, and that's how you, you roll over. So sleeping was a, a real challenge. To get three hours of sleep was a good night's sleep for me, and that's really not enough. So we had sleeping aids that we could use to get a good night's sleep before we returned. Did you wake up wondering where you were? No. <laughs> the other thing was we would uh, test those sleeping aids in our homes before we left. That was normal procedure. So you knew which sleeping tablets uh, would allow you to wake up and function if you had to wake up in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. so, so that was good. Going to the restroom is always a common question. Um, the short answer is you go very carefully. Without gravity, there's nothing pulling anything into a, a funnel or a, a volume. So uh, we have to use suction to collect the liquid waste. And uh, the solid waste was similarly, similarly captured by, by suction through a, a small container. Of course, the solid waste is compacted and brought back. The liquid waste is dumped out into space and, and sublimates. The other interesting thing is uh, dreams. So when you, we would dream, myself, when I would dream, and many were the same, on Earth, we dreamt about going to space. In space, everyone dreamed about being on Earth. No kidding. I thought that was interesting. Mm. And you wake up and say, well... I'm not only in space, but I'm over Italy, or I'm over, would you wake up in the, in the morning and see what part of the Earth you were over? Well, that was always a challenge, even in the middle of the day, because we're going around the Earth every 90 minutes. We're traveling five miles a second, so there's not a lot of dwell time over a piece of ground. So we relied on the laptop to tell us what part of the Earth we were over, and then we could narrow down geographic references. Mm -hmm. Airports are great references because of the, the runway patterns. Um, but we never got tired of looking out the window because as we're going around every 90 minutes, the Earth is rotating underneath us. So every time we came around, we saw a new part of the Earth. So it never got boring. Back to the sleep thing. So you always have something to look out, out the window. How do you stop people? Well, as a commander, my technique was when it was time to get six hours of sleep, we covered the windows. And that made everyone focus at least internally and then I didn't allow a window cover to come off until we were woken up, which is typically done by a, a radio call playing music from Mission Control. And that's when we'd open the window covers again. It's such an interesting contrast that you have incredible technology that got you to space in the first place, but the, the challenges that you're referencing here are, are everyday things. It's fixing the toilet, right? Which right. <laughs> now you have to at home. You don't have any excuse. If you can fix the toilet on the space shuttle, you can fix the one at home. So now, I hope my wife doesn't hear this. <laughs> you probably don't get the. I don't have an excuse to call the, the plumber. But you know, getting good sleep, all these things. That, that's interesting uh, contrast. Well, let's talk about the claustrophobia at all. Was that ever an issue uh, in the shuttle? And then, kind of, how does NASA test you for that? How do, how do they look out for that in advance? Okay, I'm going to answer the first uh, part of that uh, initially. During the screening process, to test us for claustrophobia, they put us in a round sphere, and the sphere was actually designed to allow an astronaut in a spacesuit to take other crew members in these spheres from one vehicle that's malfunctioned to a rescue vehicle. That was never used, but the theory was still uh, a possibility. In space, in as, space. A, as a spacewalk, space. okay. Yes, so because of that, they test us in those spheres. So imagine you got your socks and shorts and t-shirt on and they put you in a beach ball size sphere, zip it up, have a mic on you, there's no lights in there, and they don't tell you how long you're going to be in there. So they're just listening to your breathing and when you relax, they let you out. Wow. That's how That's they test the this test. claustrophobia. No more context than that. It's just, hey, get in here and we're going to listen to you for a little bit. Right. 
Wow. And the only time I've ever experienced claustrophobia in my life was on the space shuttle. And that's unusual because without gravity, the volume essentially doubles because you're not stuck to the floor. Mm -hmm. And you can have people hanging from the ceiling or floating from the ceiling, and it doesn't seem any more crowded um, by doubling the number of people. Mm -hmm. But we had sleep bunks. They're sleep stations. They're stacked along one of the walls of the shuttle, and one of them on the bottom was the smallest one. And on my uh, third mission, they were testing sound insulation, soundproofing inside that. So they had uh, a coating of material around it, which made the volume smaller. And in my mind, made it look like a coffin. I spent one night in there and I couldn't sleep until I cracked the door open. That's the only time I've been claustrophobic. So you said your room in the cabin kind of doubles effectively once you get into a zero gravity environment. Are you still kind of bumping elbows with everybody? Do you feel like you have a lot of space? How does that kind of change throughout the mission? So there's two different configurations that I've flown in that are available in the shuttle, assuming you're not going to a space station. So if you're just going to work in the shuttle, you have the cockpit, which is about the size of a DC-10 or you know, seven, triple seven cockpit, roughly that size. And we have four people there for launch and landing. We take the two rear seats out once we're in space. So that volume is available. And then immediately below that is what we call the mid deck. And that has seats for launch and landing that are also taken down during uh, orbit. So that gives enough volume where five people can work comfortably in that. And you know, you're gonna have to share the space, but you're not elbow to elbow. Mm -hmm. And because of the lack of gravity, you can actually get separated because somebody might be working with their feet on the floor and somebody else has got their belly up against the uh, ceiling looking out the window with taking pictures. Mm -hmm. And again, zero gravity makes the volume much more useful and less crowded. Mm -hmm. It's really roomy when we carry the lab, which we did on two of my missions. The lab was put in the payload bay where normally you might have a satellite and the laboratory is about the same size as a city bus. Mm -hmm. So that was a great place for 80 experiments and a large volume that you could exercise in, um, actually play in, and we could do uh, tumbling. It had a tunnel that connected that with the mid deck and you could uh, float down the tunnel. So those two configurations um, made it enough that in the, in the roomy configuration with the lab, 18 days was very easy to do. My crew could have spent another week comfortably in the shuttle part of it, just the cab and the, uh, the cockpit and the mid-deck, probably 10 days is enough and, and you're ready to come home. Ready to get home. Yeah. So when you first get to space, is there any time built into the mission? I, this, this might sound um, immature, but it's only because I've never been to space. Is there, is there moments built in there to kind of have just the gleeful expression of, I'm in space, I'm weightless, I, I'm just, but before you kind of get to work, is there, is there a few moments built in there just to kind of take it in? Or is it, hey, as soon as you launch, I mean, you're right to the checklist and you're working. It's a very insightful question. So the bottom line is NASA does not build in any free time, especially when you first get to space. It's extremely busy because you have to reconfigure from being a rocket to being a satellite. So all the things that you had set up that were allowing you to safely launch under all those G's with the suits on, now you got to get rid of all that stuff so you can go to work in space. Mm -hmm especially if you're gonna deploy a satellite. We tried to do that the first day because that's the reason you went and you wanna get that thing out in case you have to return. So the first day you don't get a break until they say it's time to go to sleep and they stop talking to you. That's when your fun time starts. That's when you have the moment of- But the best days as a crew member in space were the days when you were prepared to re-enter. Typically they're trying to get you into the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and you would pray for the weather to be bad because that meant another day in space. You got some free time. With free time. Huh. That's when we broke out the music and just hung by the windows and got the cameras out and took pictures of, uh, we could always take a few personal items mm -hmm. and you'd use that free time to you know, show your loved one, you might have flown a watch or a ring for them, take that picture with the earth in the background. Wow. That's when you did all that stuff. Because wow. I've got to imagine, especially, you know, for for your missions as a commander, I, I imagine you flew with some people that it was their first time in space. Oh yeah. Um, and and if you're expecting them to kind of get to work, 
they can't act like they've been there before because they've never been there, right? So the mo they don't get that moment of, hey, let's just take this in for a second. It's, it's right to work. Okay, so one of the major problems of space travel is space adaptation syndrome. So about a third of the folks on your crew typically are vomiting the first day. And another third aren't feeling 100% because they don't feel well. So that's their gleeful moment of I'm in space. Well, <laughs> so NASA speaking. understands that. Mm -hmm. They've learned that from the Mercury and Apollo days that uh, you can't rely on the human to be 100% the first day. So they timed our tasks during training and they doubled that time for the first day. And they added about 50% to it for the second day, so you weren't really working full speed until the third day. Mm -hmm. Well, because you're, you're up there doing tests and doing missions, but, but your experience in, in space is probably just as much a, a test as the, all the other experiments you're running, right? Because they're seeing how things are impacting you and how you perform and things they can learn for the future, right? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we weren't allowed to do tests on primates other than humans. <laughs> So, Go figure. so yes, um, the advantage of being a pilot, though, is they couldn't do anything invasive because they needed the pilots to be healthy for the landing. But on my <laughs> last mission, we end. had five guinea pigs, and they were drawing blood twice a day, every day. So you mentioned re-entry and, and praying for bad weather. I'll, I'll keep that in mind when things are delayed in the future for uh, when I'm watching other missions. But flying the space shuttle, if, you know, we're, we're uh, sitting in front of some airplanes here, it's probably pretty difficult to liken that to flying a 182 or a Super Cub. But if you had to kind of describe, it's like this airplane if you changed what? I mean, how do you try to explain to other pilots and non-pilots what flying a gliding space shuttle is like? It is unique, but I would say it's similar to doing a 20-degree dive bomb pass in a fighter in landing. Instead of dropping a weapon, you do the 20-degree dive and just land on a runway. That's how dynamic it is. Mm -hmm. But you're flying a 737 sized vehicle that weighs 110 tons mm -hmm. with no way to go around. Mm -hmm. So the, the training is critical there. Each commander has at least 1,200 practice landings in the shuttle training aircraft, the modified Gulfstream, mm -hmm. uh, before we would let them command. 1,200. Wow. So what's plan B in that scenario? Being long seems easier to crack for than being short, but what's, um, what, what are some of your uh, kind of contingencies when so you're we had, back in? So we have uh, prepared landing sites during the launch phase. For example, if we lose uh, an engine during liftoff and we can't make it back to Florida, we would go to Europe or Africa. But we don't do that for landing. If we're going to overshoot, there's a small chance we can make it to Puerto Rico or something downrange. If we're going to be short, uh, there might be Dias, Texas, but those were extremely unlikely scenarios. If you couldn't get to the runway, the most likely scenario was bailing out. And we would make that decision, uh, commander's decision, to uh, bail out. And once we got below 40,000 feet, one of the mission specialists on the mid deck could blow the hatch, the same hatch that we climb in through. Uh, can be jettisoned and then there was a pole that extended out that hatch and you connected your parachute harness to that pole and you, that would allow you to slide under the wing and your parachute allowed you to reach the ground safely. You know, now that you've been to space four times, I think this is the, the, the most important question I want to ask you is, how's your perspective changed now being back on Earth? Uh, the common experiences that we all share that have been to space is that there are no political borders visible from space. And yet we're still teaching students geography on maps that have borders on. So one of the interesting things was when we first got to space trying to identify geographic features that we were taught on maps with a political border was much more challenging because the political borders aren't there. You know, they're, they're man-made or artificial. So we shouldn't be teaching geography with political borders on them. Every uh, leader in the world should go to space because you get the perspective that we are one human race surviving on a spaceship called Earth. And we have that shared experience. I'm not sure if we're alone in the universe, but we're sure alone in this solar system and we need to take care of the spaceship we're living on. It's mm -hmm. a great answer. And did that perspective 
Did you have that after the first launch where launches two, three, and four, you then got to appreciate and kind of live out that perspective while you're in space or, or how did that kind of change over uh, time? It struck me, the, the first mission, mm -hmm. because that was when I was first trying to find those features. And I was struggling with why can't I find the Pyrenees? Well, because there's no border on the, on the map there. You got to look at it. So let's talk about kind of the recent SpaceX launch uh, with astronauts Bob Benkin and, and Doug Hurley. Sure. Talk to us from, from a, a shuttle commander and pilot's perspective. What is it like watching that mission unfold? So I watched that launch with my pilot on the space shuttle. He lives not too far from me here in the hill country of Texas. So the two of us uh, got together and we watched it with the wives you know, in the background. And uh, we talked about the exact question. We, we don't know much about their vehicle. It was interesting to see that they were looking at two large flat screens, or maybe there were three, where we looked at windows and we had essentially engineering displays that were not very user friendly. So it's completely new generation of technology. You, you might think that we've gone backwards because we're now using uh, capsules instead of a winged vehicle. Well, we wanted the winged vehicle for different reasons. We were carrying heavy cargo to space. Found out that wasn't a very reliable way to do it. So if you can take a smaller vehicle and, and make it reusable, like they have now with the capsules, it's much more cost effective and reliable. And now you don't have to be a test pilot. You know, those guys had both been through test pilot school, and it was a test flight, but the days of requiring a test pilot to man the vehicle, is they're gone. Mm -hmm. And that opens up the opportunity for a lot more diverse people on Earth to experience space. Mm -hmm. Well, and everything seems so automated now. I mean, your point about their flat screens, and, and, and I remember launching watching the launch and they would say so many times that hey, from this point onward um, it's automated you know the, they don't they don't have intervention there's nothing to do so contrast that against flying the shuttle and, and you were displaying or you were describing kind of the mechanical displays so I mean they're obviously worlds apart but give us your perspective on that so we always left the shuttle on autopilot during launch we could take manual control but there are a lot of risks doing that so same with with any other rocket Ideally, you want the computer to do it because you cannot, even your display will not be precise enough in the shuttle to prevent tearing the wings off. So we never wanted to take uh, control during uh, atmospheric flight up. On the reentry, the shuttle was flown manually during all phases of that, during the test phase. And we did a couple of times on my missions, but we always flew the landing manually because of the lack of redundancy. We only had two radar altimeters, for example. There were multiple single point failures that could cause the computers to have a bad landing. And rather than have a pilot monitor for a failure and then take control, we determined it was safer just to let the pilot fly the uh, landing and not have to worry about those failures um, that a computer couldn't handle. Mm -hmm. uh, the, so for the shuttle, we would normally take manual control four minutes before landing. And that's at 40,000 feet, just as you go subsonic over the top of the runway. So to put in perspective how dynamic that is, if we put a skydiver out there, we would land before that person would hit the ground without opening their parachute. We're coming down to 10,000 feet of a minute. So what on earth is it like landing the space shuttle? From a pilot's perspective, okay, I, I know how to land a Super Cub behind me, I know how to land a 182, Obviously, I don't know how to land a shuttle, so liken that to something. What, what is that like? Okay, I love talking about the landing because that's what the pilots get to do. <laughs> so it, it's uh, a challenge in the shuttle because we've been in zero gravity for as long as two weeks. So what happens during that time is you stop using your legs and your feet, so your brain stops sensing your feet. Hmm. Your inner ear follicles aren't being... Uh, excited because of gravity because there is no gravity. So your brain stops looking for that input as well. So what that means to a pilot is when you're landing back in gravity, your eyeballs will not slew with your skull. What that means, if you move your head and stop, your eyeball is actually jerking and what you see is the runway moving. It doesn't stop. So we had to be disciplined about keeping our 
head uh, fixed for the landing. That's one aspect. And, and how, do they, how do they train you for that? Because this sim no simulator can, can accomplish that. They don't. You have to prove it to yourself. When I landed after my first landing, I wanted to prove it, and I moved my head like that, and the, the cockpit spun. Wow. That's when I knew that they were telling me the truth. They give you a warning about that, though, yeah. right? <laughs> okay. And the other interesting aspect, back to your legs. So now we have to use the rudders and brake, brake pedals as well to land a shuttle, so you don't want to have numb feet. So the technique there was to put the lap belt on uh, after we did the, the deorbit burn. In other words, you, you know you're going to land. Strap yourself in and start pounding your feet. You've got your boots on. The boots feel like they weigh 20 pounds. But it's like your feet thawing out from being cold. It is actually painful. But if you don't do that, you won't have any, have any sensation uh, for the rudder pedals and brakes during landing. No kidding. Two unique things for yeah. landing. And is it, I mean, how does the, how does the uh, shuttle handle in, in terms of just its flight characteristics? Sure. It's, a, again, 737 size, 110-pound vehicle, but it has poor control harmony is the bottom line. So it's got great response and pitch, kind of sloppy response and roll. So it, it pitches like a fighter and rolls like a, a heavy airplane, which is fine until you get into a crosswind. And that's why we had very uh, restrictive crosswind limits, 10 to 15 knots, depending on how long you'd been in space. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine that's got to be a source of pride for you to know. I mean, um, not, not that you're you know, better than any other astronaut, but I'm proud of you just to hear, hey, I manually flew the thing, you know, for, for that portion of, of, uh, of the mission. That, that's got to uh, swell a lot of pride in you to know that you were able to do that. Well, yes, thank you for opening the door to me. <laughs> <laughs> You bet. So I'll pat your I, back. I, it's okay. Well, you can I, pat along with me. <laughs> well, I, I'm proud to say that I do have the two best shuttle landings, but I don't take full credit for it. I flew with the same co-pilot or pilot twice, and he had been one of my training pilots in the Gulf Stream. So the teamwork that we used during training was exactly the same teamwork we used on the shuttle, and that's why I give uh, credit for having two very successful uh, landings. Mm -hmm. and, and what does successful mean? Does it mean you grease the landing or yes. does it mean it just went off without a hitch or you hit, hit the target or um, well, what does that mean in terms so, of successful? So in the shuttle everything is recorded. So about a month after you get back you sit down with a room full of engineers and they tell you and show you every movement mm -hmm. you made in the flight control system. Um, but the pilots were measured on touchdown point from the threshold, speed, and descent rate. Okay. And, and you have the that, best. And I have the best. That's great. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so talking about kind of the re-entry, one thing I've always been curious about is what the kind of communications blackout phase feels like. What, is it, what does it look like? What's going through your head? And, and maybe, you know, um, you could also kind of describe to our viewers what that is, why that happens, but I'd love to hear just emotionally what's going through your head when you know that you're not able to communicate back with mission control. So the nice thing about the space shuttle was we didn't have much of a blackout at all. It was very um, minimal because our antennas could uh, broadcast through the top to a satellite. And we didn't have the uh, extreme plume uh, blocking that transmission, the pla plasma uh, coming off of the vehicle. Um, so our, our blackout periods were very short, not, and primarily due to bank angle changes because we do change from one side to the other. But uh, bottom line is, blackout was insignificant. Okay. The so how long would that, would that last for? We uh, say uh, short. Maybe 20, 30 seconds okay. was all. That still feels like a long time to me, to know, hey, you're kind of on your own for, for half a minute or well, so. Well, a lot of times there's nothing to say. If everything's going nominal, um, we're sitting back watching, monitoring, make sure everything's nominal, and if the ground's not talking, that might be a good thing. Mm-hmm, that makes sense. So, so for the SpaceX missions now that are, that are longer, the blackout phase is longer than kind of the 30 seconds. I think the Apollo, at least based on my watchings of those, seemed longer than that. Do you think that that was a similar reaction those astronauts had, that if everything's nominal, there, there's nothing really to worry about, you know, the fact that we're kind of on our own right now? Right, and when you're working in space, it's kind of nice not to have the ground <laughs> calling you all the time. That's good, yeah, give Although, a break. Although, you do have to rely on them. You've got to imagine that, you know, even on the space station now, six people working 24-7, uh, different shifts, but there are about 300 people on the ground trying to help them get the job done. So it's, it's a big team effort. You're just a pointy end of the spear if you're 
lucky enough to be the one in orbit. So after the mission concludes, I'm curious to know when's kind of the first moment that you can actually take a deep breath, relax, and think about something other than being in space. I mean, even you know, as I watch the SpaceX missions, um, there, there's a lot of procedure and process and things that happen as there should be afterwards. So I'm curious kind of how long would it take for you to be able to take a breath and, and do the first kind of normal Earth thing? I got to take out the trash. And how do you even transition from that, knowing I just did uh, a mission in space and now my, my assignment now is take out the trash? What, what, when's that first moment and what's that like? A great question. So when you first get back, you're actually still working because even the SpaceX uh, NASA astronauts are going to be guinea pigs. They're going to be collecting medical data that they can uh, make a large database out of. So you, you're working the day you get back. Then they typically spend one night at the landing site, Kennedy Space Center, and then return to Houston. And then you're doing public relations immediately as soon as you land. And then you get back into the office the next day and, and you're going through more medical, more technical debrief. So there really isn't a break for about the first month, typically. Uh, you're really busy. But that doesn't mean that the second day you're home, your wife isn't going, which bill do I pay here? So it was a, a common thing where within, say, five to six days from getting back into space, you kind of are getting back to Earth from space, you would have to pinch yourself going, did I really go? Because my life back here is the same. I'm coming to the office every day. I go home. The, the, there's something wrong with the kids. I got to fix the toilet or the car's broken down. It didn't really change our day-to-day -day lives that much. Even though it was a fantastic experience, your family didn't go with you. <laughs> They're still the same. Your home's the same. Mm -hmm. And did you have any rituals any, after coming home that you'd kind of do with your family or ways to kind of pinch yourself that, hey, I'm back on Earth and, and here's something I like to do to celebrate that? No, we didn't have a common one. Um, so, no, it would just celebrate and uh, enjoy the time together, share the experience a bit. Of course, the kids were pretty young when I was flying, and uh, their friends, many of them, were also children of astronauts, and it was no, no big deal. Oh, yeah, went to space? Okay, you know, what's on TV? You know, because my dad's going in two months, or my, my mom just got back a year ago, and it was normal. During show and tell, or bring your, your dad to work day, they didn't want to see an astronaut at Ed White Elementary School. <laughs> they wanted to see a fireman. Okay. Well, and what, it, what was your uh, kind of wife's demeanor when you were in space? I mean, did that change across your missions, or was she... Kind of thinking, hey, this is, this, he's on mission and, and no big deal? Or what was that like kind of managing your kind of personal home front while you were away? So uh, the wives that had jobs and my wife did worked while I was in space to try and keep routine. And if you had young kids at home, of course, you did the normal routine to keep life uh, normal for them. But um, NASA was sensitive to that. So we would get a call to our families once a week with essentially what's now called Zoom. I mean, we, we would have a private conversation on the laptop, and the only person that could eavesdrop on that was the flight surgeon trying to detect if you know, there are any issues uh -huh. with the crew person and make sure the family wasn't overburdening the crew member. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a great time, so the kids could actually see that their parent was a normal person in space. Mm -hmm. And you got to share the moment and catch up on their lives for just a couple of minutes. And then we also made uh, calls via ham radio, uh, if that was on board. So they, they tried to make it normal. We could do emails every day. And were you trying to kind of take a, a, a mental focus of, I'm on mission, I'm, I, it's gotta probably be hard not to think about your home front, your loved ones, and think about what's going on, or what was, what was kind of that, that mental focus like for you? Was that challenging, did it come naturally? Um, no, for me, I, I was more in the cockpit than I was worried about the family because I trusted my wife. She's, she's taking care of that. That's her job. My job was taking care of the vehicle and the crew in space. And it was just a nice side light to get the chance to talk to the family. But then you go right back to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're at work. Yeah, makes sense. Last question about you in space. Describe weightlessness to us. Is that, is that pretty fun? Is it weird? Did you get nauseous? What, what was uh, weightlessness like? So I did not uh, ever get nauseous on any of the missions, partly because the pilots have to stay strapped in right after we get to zero gravity. So we stay in those seats for about two hours reconfiguring the systems. 
and everybody else has to get up, stow their seats, get out of their suits. So they're thrashing about, and it's very disorienting because there's no up and down. And in fact, that was my counsel to my teammates, my crewmates, was don't establish up and down. You gotta give up on it because there's too many conflicting inputs. The other technique I used was to stay busy. Keep the crew busy so you don't think about getting ill. Just like in the airplane, you know, if somebody's feeling ill, distract get them, get them yeah. some, some uh, cool air, and, and hopefully, and, and of course we had uh, medication on board to try and prevent it, but again, we would have uh, a few vomit every day. But living and working in zero gravity takes a bit of time to get used to because it's physically effortless. We don't use our legs. In fact, we didn't wear shoes because shoes became a hazard because you could inadvertently flip a switch not knowing uh, that you'd done it. Mm -hmm. So no shoes unless you're exercising. Uh, you touch the wall, you float to the other wall. One of the challenges that I had was I'm, I'm one of those people that hammers a keyboard, bad technique in zero gravity, mm -hmm. because you have to hold yourself down by tucking your toes in a, in a cloth loop mm -hmm. to hold yourself down, otherwise you keep pushing yourself away from the keyboard. Well, the second day I was in space, I got cramps in my legs from fighting my keyboard input, so I had to learn to chill on the keyboard. Well, that doesn't seem like something anyone can warn you about until you go do it and you know you realize no. you banged the keyboard, right? Right. Uh, I lied. One more question. So, are there any That's other okay. kind of common um, um, teaching points you give your crew members as the commander or people's first time in space? Those seems like very practical uh, points. But what other advice were you giving your crew before going? So, one of the simple ones was I would say eat breakfast. There were folks that were so afraid of uh, vomiting when they got to space that they wouldn't eat breakfast. Well, breakfast was served almost six hours before we ever got to zero G. So I said, number one, it's going to be digested anyway. Number two, if you are going to get sick, you might as well have something to show for it. So <laughs> enjoy your breakfast. And the, th the real reason was if we ended up in a survival situation, the last thing you wanted to do would be dehydrated and malnourished to start with. Interesting. You know, I, I'm kind of hearing this common theme about either problems you experience in space, advice you gave your crew members. Um, not to downplay, but it sounds like normal life happening. It's, it's normal life challenges you're having, obviously on a much more sophisticated scale, but um, you're, you're dealing with normal problems up there. And I, I think sometimes that might get lost uh, to the rest of us down here. It's like, hey, they're, they're human, right? They're, they're dealing with human things up there. No, so we it's do. interesting to hear it's you say that. So when I speak to business groups, one of the things uh, they'll ask about is the, the team play. Now, how did that all work out? And I said, okay, imagine taking your team, say you have five direct reports. We're gonna put you and your five direct reports in a normal size, off, normal size office. We'll put a porty potty in there, all the food you need, all the water you're gonna need. We're gonna work you 14 hours a day. Every other day, we're gonna put you on national TV. We're gonna give you three hours of sleep a night, and you'll see some personality changes <laughs> and team dynamics. So you've accomplished so much in space. Um, you were also a, a, an aviator before going to space, and you're an aviator now, you're an active pilot. And so you've flown the, the biggest and best there is, from the space shuttle to F-16s to F-4s. So what has your aviation interest now? Well, I have to add the A380 to that. I got, I've got three landings in the A380. It was the highlight of a decade after I left NASA. Was uh, A friend of mine was a test pilot, at Airbus, and, and that was a, a great experience. Hmm. Fly-by-wire reminded me a lot of the shuttle, uh, not uh, the same experience, but, but similar. Hmm. Now I'm looking for a 182. <laughs> I fly a Stearman, and uh, flying is still a passion for me. Uh, when I was in business, I would still go out and rent airplanes. Even when I was working in Manhattan, I'd go out to White Plains and rent a plane, and people would ask me, you're such a busy executive, why do you go flying? When I fly, that's all I think about. I just focus on that, don't worry about another thing, so it's actually relaxing to go fly. I, I still have a passion for it, enjoy it, it's part of my life. Are there things you're still wanting to accomplish from an aviation perspective or kind of personal bucket list? I mean, it seems like when you've flown into the heavens, what is there left to do? But what are some other things that, that you're still looking forward to, to doing and taking part in? Well, I want to tell my grandchildren flying. Haven't had the chance to do that. I've taken all my children flying, but now they've got kids. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my bucket list, is get my grandchildren interested in aviation space. Mm -hmm. And the oldest one's only 12 now, so th there's some time to go. The other is I'm working on starting up a uh, business uh, airline on the West Coast. 
that's a new challenge for me. And, uh, and it's exciting because the industry is changing. We're going to see a change in private flying and a change in public flying. And it's going to be, in my opinion, dramatic. The two will diverge because of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, and kind of related to that, what are you kind of hoping for the space program in the future? And, and, and you were you were obviously an integral part of that, flying four missions. You, you accomplished a lot of things, with why the shuttle was launched in the first place, but also the experiments that were done on you and your crew members. I mean, you, you are a very important role in kind of the, the spectrum of, of what space travel has become and where it's going. So what's kind of your perspective on what, what you're kind of hoping for the future of, of space and, and kind of looking forward to watching happen in your lifetime? Well, I think you're seeing it right now with, with the SpaceX and, and shortly the Boeing uh, Dreamliner uh, or Starliner will, will fly. And it is uh, opening up the opportunity for almost everyone to go into space. You won't have to be, as I said before, a test pilot. You won't have to be in a government employee. You won't even have to be rich. The price is going to drop. The diversity of needs in space is already expanding. Remember, it initially started out test pilots and researchers to go to the moon. Well, then we needed medical doctors and chemists uh, and physicists to do the experiment in space. Now we have a space station that's been up for over two decades. You need people that can maintain that. Um, as we go further out into space, back to the moon, onto Mars, we're going to need plumbers, construction people, uh, a, a diverse uh, group of needs, artists. So. I think it's great. Uh, just as aviation expanded during the first half of the 19th century, travel in space is going to expand the first half of this century. Well, I can't wait to watch that unfold. That's very much on my bucket list to go to space. So we'll see if that gets to happen one day. Do it. <laughs> so you've flown the A380, you've flown the shuttle, you've flown 182s, you've flown Stearman, you've flown all kinds of stuff. So looking back on all of that, what's your favorite aircraft or spacecraft uh, to have flown? the one I'm flying at the time. <laughs> I love them all uh, because they're, they're all different. I love the F-16, but thought the F-15 was a much easier airplane to fly. They had different missions. That's why they, they flew differently. The Stearman, I love the feel of the air. It reminds me of skydiving because you feel every burble. You, you feel every touch of the runway. Uh, I love the 182 because you can take people with you and share the experience and actually go somewhere. I haven't found an airplane I don't like. You're one of the very few astronauts in the world. What do you tell people now that are looking to either have a career in space or, or related to the space program? It's a very, uh, it's a very small group. It's a very elite group. Um, what do you tell people that are looking to get into something like that? So related to another answer, the needs in space for human skills and knowledge are, is going to continue to expand. So young people need to identify what they have a passion for and pursue that. And that could be engineering, medical doctor, artist, whatever it is, even a trade, the plumber, the electrician. Find what you're passionate about, pursue that, because that enables you to either be the best at that. And then when that skill or knowledge is needed in space, you'll be a likely candidate. Mm. Interesting. Well, uh, maybe they'll need a YouTube channel in space. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, get there. So, Tom, you, you're um, kind of a, a personal hero for me in a way in that, you know, you have flown to space. You're, you're an active aviator. You're an accomplished businessman. Um, and, and those are things that I love and get to enjoy. And so to get to hear you talk about those things is very enriching for me and things I care about. I'd be curious... Um, from you as the astronaut, what are things, you, you have been to space, you've done all these things, what are things here on Earth that you really care about and, and, and you want people to kind of be aware about as well? Great question. So I want everyone to reach their full potential. And too often, young people will limit their future options by what they choose to study in school. So I absolutely believe that young people need to take STEM courses science, technology, engineering, math, and the arts as well, but they need to get a broad background at an early age. I'm talking sixth to eighth grade is about the age group that are making decisions that will change their lives or limit their options. So they need to continue to take those math and engineering classes or science classes into high school so that they can have that option 
if they choose to in the future. So I support one of the local uh, charities here is the Science Mill in Johnson City. It targets rural uh, disadvantaged uh, students to get them involved in STEM in a hands-on way. There are thousands of opportunities around the globe to help young people get interested in those things that will give them opportunities as adults. And where can people learn more about the Science Mill? Uh, online. Just Google the Science Mill and uh, contact me through <laughs> <laughs> Airplane Academy. Okay, there we go. Most important is we got to talk about your sock game here. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about your socks. So we've got the uh, shuttle here. We've got uh, the early um, Russian space station here. Oh, there's the orbiter. Another shot of the orbiter. Looks like uh, the Ariane there. So just a spectrum of space. <laughs> Where do we get those? From your grandkids at Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Tom, it's been an absolute honor to speak to you and hear uh, about your time in space, how that's changed your perspective. And I know for me as a pilot, it's, it's even more encouraging just to hear you think, um, hey, any airplane, the plane I'm flying at the time is, is the one I, I love to get to do. And I think uh, for the rest of us that, that might not ever get to go to space, we, it, it's encouraging to me to know that uh, it doesn't have to be the space shuttle. It can be the 182. It can be, uh, you know, just anything to get in the air is, is a kind of common experience that we can all share. And so thank you so much for your time and all the information and how you've served our country in the Air Force uh, and in space and beyond. So thank you again. Thank you, Charlie, for having me on Airplane Academy. And I hope you're on your way to Mars within a decade. <laughs> we'll see you there. Hey, everyone, thank you so much for tuning into this incredibly special episode of Airplane Academy. Thank you again to Mr. Tom Henricks, U.S. Air Force, NASA, um, everyone that is participating in uh, the space program. It's an honor to get to watch it, and it's an honor to get to talk with astronauts like Tom. So thanks again for watching. We'll see you guys next Monday at 8 a.m. for the next episode.